On the Gravidal podcast this week, I am pleased to be joined by Castig. He is the founder of Console.xyz, um, basically building a communications alternative platform, Web3 communities, something that you know a lot of people are looking forward to or looking for some sort of alternative here at Gravidal. We're obviously very passionate about governance and finding ways to enable communities better, um, finding ways to ensure that decentralized communities can actually achieve their mission in a, a, fa- a manner that does not sacrifice decentralization. So I look forward to speaking more about this and casting. Thank you so much for coming on this week. So happy to be here. Thanks for having me on. And before we get into console, do you mind just quickly providing a background yourself, who you are, how you got into crypto, Web3, just the whole entire story and rabbit hole that you went down? Um, well, that's like a book, so I'll just kind of summarize it. <laughs> TLDR. Uh, I guess, you know, uh, I was a music major in college, taught myself how to code, learned to code, somehow discovered decentralization um, through like, BitTorrent and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, I think I was kind of all primed when I saw, um, when I saw, you know, Bitcoin and Ethereum and just what was possible with Web3, you know, I had had a whole career building Web2 apps and I even started a company um, teaching people how to code. It was called One Month. We went through Y Combinator and we grew that in New York City for a while. So, you know, I had this whole building a web two, you know, building on the internet, basically Mm -hmm. experience. But I think I was primed when I saw the power of whether we call it like peer to peer decentralized um, communications, it just seemed like it blew my mind. So um, yeah, when I realized just last summer that I wanted to start a new company um, that, you know, I was just like, how can I add value? How can I, you know, who can I collaborate with? And what what can we build? So that's kind of how it all started. Mm -hmm. Very cool. I'm curious. So you start out, you're looking at things like BitTorrent and peer-to-peer technology. Did you then end up in something like Bitcoin and then you went down to the more smart contract route or did you go right to smart contracts and um, looking at more of like the Web3 world? What was your what was your entry point there? Yeah, I think my entry point was Bitcoin in 2013. Um, when we started the, our last company, when you at least back in the day, when you would go to Y Combinator, you would go in person, mm-hmm. and so we had to move there, you know, for about four months. And um, you know, there's this William Gibson quote, really like it's something like uh, the future is already here, like on the earth, it's already exists with us, but it's just not equally distributed, like in all different places. And I remember when I got to. I probably had that experience at least like twice. Once I lived in Japan once. So once when I lived in Japan and the other was living in Silicon Valley and all of a sudden in 2013, people were using Bitcoin to pay each other, <laughs> like in like a really awkward, weird way. But I was fascinated. Um, actually, at first I thought it was kind of maybe like ridiculous, but it soon it soon pulled me in. Um, yeah. And then so I'd say from there, I kind of gradually started like, you know, treading into yeah it. they kept going from there and then i think what 2013 is right around the mount gox hack as well yeah i think that was the year yeah i yeah, think it was, was the summer the that we were in silicon valley that, that happened actually yeah that's pretty wild yeah so you've seen you've seen the whole picture of this play out then you've lived through the booms and busts of the, of the last two cycles which <laughs> it's been an interesting time and i think a lot's changed and I, I know you've probably drawn a lot of inspiration from what you've seen and observed throughout those those times but just moving on a little bit here and um, getting into what console is, can do you mind just providing the background story of console, how your team came together, what you're looking to solve, um, and maybe some of just the founding inspirations behind the project? Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, so console, it's console.xyz. Um, console is Web3 chat. And some people, I think, wonder well, what does it mean to be Web3 chat? And, you know, for me, um, how I define it is also how I got you know, inspired to to work on the project is it means um, having some degree of decentralization, openness, and then shared ownership, right? And so I think those, that could mean a lot of different things. So I'll kind of break it down. And the thing that got me excited about console was um, about last summer and in, in the summer of 2021, um, just looking at the growth of Web3, uh, the term Web3 had been around for um, quite a few uh, years now. I want to say actually Web3 came from the Polkadot community and the mm-hmm. Web3 uh, Foundation, which kind of came out of there. But it kind of got, last summer, it got really kind of, um, just it blew up, I'd say the term. 
Uh, and so now I'm seeing, you know, all these Web3 communities that have these values that I just described of decentralization and openness and shared ownership, all building on Discord. And Discord, um, you know, Discord was made for gamers. Mm -hmm. And as such, it was very closed and had no, uh, like... <laughs> ownership or openness or any of that, uh, you know, is very centralized. So it just seemed to me like an opportunity, you know, it really just started with the question for us, like, well, what if you could use your decentralized identity, whether that's your .eth or your .btc or whatever your decentralized identity is, use the blockchain identity, basically, so that you own your own identity and you could chat with other people. I think that was just like the simplest implementation. And then seeing, you know, okay, Web3 is going to have all these values. People are building these things. Like it's going to have to move away from Discord at some point. Maybe we could help uh, be part of that conversation and build something that people really love. Mm hmm and from a philosophical standpoint now, because you've touched upon it a little bit throughout that, this is something I like to ask a lot of the guests who come on the podcast as well, is, is thinking about decentralization or Web3. Because we know something like Web3 has become such a convoluted and murky word. I mean, people use it interchangeably for crypto or just specific applications like Helium that have maybe more real world use or potential use or speculation. Um, but to you, for decentralization specifically, um, what do you, what, how do you define decentralization? What does it really mean to you? Um, and how is that at the core of what you're building with console? Yeah. Wow. That's a really great question. Um, I feel like it's worth people, you know, in general having more time about, so yeah, let's chat about that. Um, so mm -hmm. I guess first off, what is decentralization? Um, to me, decentralization means resilience, um, I think decentralization is like the how of how we get to being more resilient. And so what do I mean by resilient? Um, I think that the way that the internet started itself is probably the best story of like an image of what decentralization is. So I don't know if you've, you've heard that story before. Do you know that one? How the internet started Wait, in the, the 60s? The beginning, is it, wasn't a government backed program, yeah? Yeah, yeah, right. it was a government backed program. Um, but do you know why the government was was investing in the internet? Weren't they looking for like backdoor? Wasn't the whole darknet backdoor sort of communications channel? Wasn't that the idea behind it? Maybe at some point. Um, but the real reason that the internet was funded um, was that we were afraid that specifically that the Soviets would nuke us. <laughs> you know, the, a nuclear attack. Fair enough. Um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> The internet was actually funded uh, after Sputnik, which was this the Soviet satellite appeared in the sky uh, in 1957. And then from there, the uh, I think it was Eisenhower at the time. But anyway, he basically funds DARPA, which is this mm -hmm. organization to, that creates the internet, which is called ARPANET. But long story short, um, I share all that because if you, if you think about the original problem of decentralization, which is what they were calling it back then, um, the question was, okay, we have these nodes, basically these like computers all over the United States. How can we design a system so that if a nuclear attack happens in any part, any quadrant of the United States, that the other ones would still be online and not be offline? And so this was the question that they brought um, to a guy named Paul Barron, who ends up you know, really thinking about it and writing about it. Uh, and he actually does one of the original diagrams for decentralization that still gets used today. And the idea being that um, if you think about just like the geography of the United States and you think about any one computer going down, the idea mm. was we need to not have central points of failure, right? If, there, if everything gets routed through one central point, all you have to do is attack that central point. And then whoever our enemies are could know that weakness and take, take us down, right? Mm -hmm. So I think that's like, just really compelling visual, um, <laughs> like wraps in survivalism right into it. And th that same model is has been used, and literally the same graphics that were used for the nuclear attack uh, were used in designing, you know, Napster and BitTorrent. Because the idea mm -hmm. there was, how do we have people share music? And you can imagine people are similarly have computers all around the world. How do we have people share music? And we, you know, we want to make sure that if anyone were to attack us, basically try to take us down, 
there was no one place that they could do it. So they'd have to take all of us down, right? And so that's really what decentralization, like the roots of it are. And, you know, people don't use the word resilience as much, but I think that's like probably the non-technical term of what you're trying to do. You're trying to make a resilient system that can take to withstand <laughs> an inordinate amount of attacks and still survive. And I think that's Bitcoin now. I mean, Bitcoin has survived, you know, since um, 2009, um, withstanding a, a bunch of uh, technical and regulation mm. attacks so far. Um, and I think that's what we want to think about as a model for how we create future communication systems and, and also, you know, with console as well. That's like what's on our mind. That, that's a great definition there. And, and so much to break down in that story. I mean, I think about it, I'm in my early 20s and there's so much that has come before me in, in like my time, quote unquote, if you want to put it like that. But just being able to go back in history and look at, you know, Napster or BitTorrent or just the early stages of peer to peer or the, er well, the early 1990s electronic cash systems, which inevitably failed. Um, and then looking at how these systems have evolved or look at something like the Internet, which started out, you know, as, as a government backed program, then. Um, was kind of co-sponsored by the pornography industry <laughs> to help distribution there. And that helped you know, a lot of the innovations for streaming and all of that as well. Um, but, you know, just really weird and fascinating ways in which all these ideas spread out and people got really involved with it. Um, and then looking at something like Bitcoin in 2017, which I think, you know, as someone who's been in crypto now for or Web3 or Bitcoin or just interested in the space for a couple of years, um, electronic electronic money um it's just it's crazy to me you know the really perspective of what happened during the uh block size wars and when people were debating over you know how much transact how much how much data can you fit into a bitcoin block um i mean that was legitimately an existential threat i think to the bitcoin community and something that uh, i think a lot of individuals who may or who might be newer I, I really think i recommend going back in time because that was an ultimate like coordination issue and you had to get so many stakeholders on board uh and you know there was plentiful of hard forks for the bitcoin um, protocol but in the end of the day the original protocol you know stayed and is still functioning to this day and has survived a crazy crazy internal um, debate and conflict so i think a lot of just relevant information you bring up there and and how that all fits into decentralization and then where you want to go with console um and so i, I want to now take it into maybe the shoes of someone who wants to bring their community onto a platform like console and uh, maybe get away from some, maybe some of the more traditional communication channels if um, there are concerns about uh, how decentralized and how resilient some of these systems currently are for Web3. Um, and so say I start a DAO and let's call it the, uh, we'll call it the pen DAO. We're all pen enthusiasts. I don't know. <laughs> or the book DAO, yeah. right? So, or, so let's, let's go with my book DAO because that's, that's probably a bit more of a, a, a topic people can talk about, right? So I start my book DAO and I want to bring it on a console. Just walk me through the process. You know, say we build it on Ethereum. So just, just you know, simple mainnet Ethereum community. What yeah. does that look like? You know, how do I? Do we have we connect our Ethereum wallets. How do I bring people on board? Um, how how are you focusing on things like UI to make it easier to on ramp? What's that whole process look like? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Great question. When you first come to console, so if you booked out is on console, um, the First thing would be that the admins set up the console, right? So the admins, whoever that is, it could be one person, it could be a few people, um, you know, kind of similar to setting up Discord or Slack, you know, mm -hmm. a few people set it up. Um, and they're in charge of creating the requirements for bringing on the community, the token gating or authentication, whatever you want to call it. So for example, if the admins of BookDAO want to have some kind of gating around decentralized identity, they can enforce that, you know, we only want .eth names. You have to have a .eth name. Maybe, maybe they do that because it gives some kind of credibility and helps to reduce the amount of sock puppets or, you know, bots or something, you know, whoever, because mm -hmm. um, you're like, you have to have a registered ETH name. Um, I think there's some interesting things we could do over time too. Like maybe you have a .eth name that you've had for a year, right? Like all of these things start to make, when we talk about resilience, it starts to make a stronger system um, for people coming on. So .eth name, it could be that the book DAO has an NFT and you can use that for community gating, or it could be a token. Maybe you have a, like a ERC-20, you know, book, mm -hmm. basically like token. Um, any number of these or combination of these can become the requirement for bringing people onto your community. Um, you could even have no, no, I mean, it's up to you. You could also have no um, gating. And in that case, it, you would just still need a wallet 
Um, on console, we don't have email password verification. So we don't have your identity in our database. Uh, you have it with your web wallet. So it's your web wallet that people will use. And so, yeah, um, once you create the community and you create the gating, then the community can all join um, based on that token there. Hmm. And so you start from that. And so you now you can bring your people in. And now that I have my community and booked out ready, and we want to speak about Harry Potter or whatever, <laughs> whatever sure. the kids are, kids are reading these days. Um, how do I, how is this the management aspect of this go? I mean, is there going to be certain channels that only certain people get access to? Is there going to be you know, more general chat? Is it going to look more familiar to people who are used to things like Discord and Slack? Um, how does the actual day to day look like for someone either on the membership side or also the community management side? Yeah, uh, that's a great question. So I would say that the experience that we're creating, if you have used both Discord and Slack, I would say it feels a bit more like Slack. Um, mm -hmm. Why is that? I would say it's because one of the things we're really focused on at Console are communities, helping communities focus and get things done, especially. So I'm really excited about a lot of DAOs out there um, like Cabin DAO, I don't know if you know who are working to kind of decentralize cities, um, mm -hmm. or Archive DAO, which are having shared ownership of museum pieces. Um, there's certain DAOs out there that are bringing people together and they're creating something or doing something or investing in something, right? And my hypothesis, I guess, just after you know watching and being part of many, many DAOs that are very web three communities, is that if you are trying to coordinate with people and get things done, or even just have meaningful conversations about a book club, it doesn't help at all to try to connect with people in a chat forum when there's these, I, I call them uh, like wolves, basically, like they're basically like a wolf in sheep's clothing. Like they're basically in the room and they're trying to like steal your, trying to rug you. They're trying to steal mm. your NFTs. They're trying to shill. They're just like, I just want to have a conversation with people who care. Right. And, and like on the flank on the side, you're getting all this like noise and stuff. So, um, and so that's what we're help, trying to help people do is focus token gating, decentralized identity is part of that. But then all the things you mentioned, all the things that people do in discord often with bots and like little hacks are possible now natively in console, you could have a room that is just for people with a certain token or a certain uh, level of, you know, uh, credibility or reputation and all that kind of stuff. So, yeah, I'd say, you know, the future is is fairly bright for as far as how you want to create your community, and um, we just kind of want to be the somewhat neutral platform to help mm -hmm. you manage it how you like. And you mentioned a bit there about some of your background with just various DAOs and decentralized communities and Web3 communities. Um, I guess over your time and your experience in the space, what has been one of the largest holdups you've seen when it comes to actual coordination? Um, have there been any major roadblocks, you'd say, in which DAOs have been able to organize? Or just what, I guess, what, what do you see as some of the largest issues with governance in general currently? Yeah, well, I think of governance... Uh, just to define governance, um, mm -hmm. I think a lot of people use the word governance to just mean voting. And I'm not saying that you were necessarily saying that, but I think that's like common. Um, mm -hmm. I think of governance more broadly as, you know, just how does a body of people make decisions together? Mm -hmm. And voting can be one method for how that happens. But, you know, another form of governance is the question of just like who gets to speak, right? Who gets mm. to put things into the pot and all that kind of stuff. Um, so, you know, I guess the question was like, in my own experience, how have I seen governance, like, was Change, it good examples evolve, or, right. or evolve, evolve? Yeah. I mean, the obvious thing that like we're seeing a lot of is people voting on Snapshot. I think that mm -hmm. in the past year has become like the main driver for trying to make decisions. Um, I think that also, you know, I think when we look at chat platforms, like another, another reason that we're building console and that we're trying to um, help people focus is we've chatted with some of the bigger DAOs and, and I won't mention the one that had this problem, but one DAO basically came to us and they said, you know, we're having trouble because we send people to discord and, we're losing people. Mm. They're 
going over there and they're just overwhelmed and they were so excited before they joined, you know, before they, when they applied, they were so excited when we interviewed them and now they got in there and they don't know what to do. I think of that as like a flaw in governance in itself, because if you can't get more voices in and you can't have people coordinate to, you know, share in the vote or share in, in the, uh, the future of the DAO, then, you know, that DAO in particular felt like they were, um, really struggling. And so like what they did, I guess, which is like, I think kind of interesting is, um, I think of it kind of like an onion is like, they have like different layers of governance. And so they have the layer of governance, which is, you know, maybe the 20 to 30 people at the center who are like Mm -hmm. the OGs who have some kind of like certain kind of vote, almost like a representative Senate or something. Right. And then they use like a different, they use telegram to put all of the like few hundred people on the outside of it and these different governance methods. And, you know, now it seems like some DAOs like the one I'm describing are essentially just recreating, like it feels like a government at this point. It's like, we right. have like the local municipality, we have like the central, um, I, I guess my lesson from, from this was like, I think as we grow, we're gonna have different challenges. I think it's gonna be really interesting. And I just think it's super early days for how decentralized communities organized so Mm -hmm. yeah yeah and and going to your first point there is a lot of people think of governance as solely just voting and i think that's a i think i think defining it as outside of just you know the fact it's pretty pretty basic you know it's just decision making that's what governance means it's just how you make decisions um and i think a lot of people have this idea that governance has to be this free for all everyone (laughs) everyone's voting one token one vote i think this has kind of become a very standardized system when really governance is just a very broad topic and it's a very um it's a whole entire new area of pioneering and where we can go from there and what it means and how you organize communities and what you best see fit um but yeah as you mentioned right there like why would you have a core team on discord and then having to have another team that's not necessarily the core team but just influential individuals in your doubt on telegram um and then you know maybe you have the other like the rest of the community still on discord so there's there's a whole crossover there i could see a lot of um potential just miscommunication or holdups or um inefficiencies because of just having to deal with communication across various platforms which it's already difficult enough right now trying to figure out you know how are we going to communicate in a totally digital setting um, which is still i mean basically new I, for a lot of people it's a very new experience in the last few years um i did i i, I switched the order of topics here but i do want to get back a little bit on discord and that is looking at some of the ways um and, and you mentioned it right there with with discord as well but looking at some of the inefficiencies right now you see with some of these platforms um is there anything outside of that coordination aspect that you just mentioned um in which you have critiques of discord or slack I think that the the most obvious thing with Discord has been the amount of security breaches that we've mm-hmm. had in the past year. There have been hundreds, hundreds, like maybe thousands at this point um, of cases and literally millions of dollars stolen in NFTs and tokens. And this is no, this is nothing new. You could just Google it and you'll see. Um, so I think the thing there, you know, it ties back into what I was sharing earlier with this idea of like having a wolf, like I think of the game werewolf or wolf in sheep's clothing. And I think the idea is like when you're trying to have something, whether it's a secure chat or a trusted community, whatever it is, you know, if security is so important. So like, how are we going to build the future of Web3? If Web3 is something that I hope, you know, that we can extend beyond ourselves to the greater world, just like the internet has such, you know, nearly every aspect of society around the world. You know, if we want to bring that to the rest of the world beyond just our NFT communities, beyond just, you know, blockchain week and all and all the things that we are enjoying, but to like broader government, to business, to NGOs, to community, um, no one's going to touch it if it's this thing that people get hacked every week. Uh, So I think that is uh, among, you know, some of the more troubling things I've seen with discord. Um, I'll also just also add like a little plug, but um, I spent the past month uh, with a secure cybersecurity firm that console has hired. um, And we looked at over a hundred discord hacks in order to come up with some lessons that console could learn. 
and how to be more secure. And then we also shared that on our blog. So if anybody's listening uh, and curious to learn more about not only you know some of the issues with, with Discord, but also how to protect your communities, we we did a lot of research and shared it. And that's just at blog.console.xyz. Or Rick, if you have any questions, happy to kind of tell you more about that. <laughs> yeah, I, I'd, I'd love to jump into that. Also, if anyone's listening, I'll make sure to have any mentioned links in the show notes so people can just click on there and, and hop on in. Um, but yeah, I do want to just hop off of that to the idea behind maybe more the back end of what console is going to look like. And are you going to be running a, a distributed network of servers or nodes? And is that going to be what keeps the console infrastructure alive? And if so, how are you going to incentivize people? I guess walk me through that idea as well. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so I think the question is also like, how decentralized is console going to be? Mm -hmm. um, you know, right now um, there's two community. There are two communities using console, and what they are doing is just using the decentralized identity portion. So like I've described so far. Um, so right now, identity is decentralized and transactions are decentralized, but the infrastructure itself isn't yet decentralized. It's mm -hmm. fairly centralized. Um, we're looking at a progressively you know, decentralized approach. So I think for us, the idea is like, let's just build something people love. Let's build a, let's build a, a UI and an experience, an iPhone app. Like let's, you know, let's really kind of build this amazing experience. And then as we grow, you know, we, we have a number in our heads, like we're hoping to, once we have about 10,000 community members on console, uh, I think that's when we'll start to reimagine how we can decentralize our own stack. Mm -hmm. But to us, it's going to be a step-by-step -step process. If we, if we wanted to go down that route, we, and we of course thought about it, you know, it might take us a whole nother year to launch. And then we're like, well, by that point, you know, somebody else will have done it or done some, you know. So I think starting with the user experience has been our first um, kind of problem to solve, and then mm -hmm. from there, uh, progressively decentralizing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and a lot of a lot of projects follow the same idea and philosophy. You, know, you want to make sure you have the rails and everything correct first, and then yeah. as time moves on, you can then ensure that you know things are working properly. Now we feel more comfortable giving away exactly you know, more of more of the uh, ownership in that respect. Um, and then I want to then ask you now about not necessarily competition, but I guess it would be competition. Um, and and you see a lot of arguments against how Web three will break up, you know, big tech firms or those who have maybe ownership of the current internet space, and whether it's a social media platform, a music streaming platform, video streaming, whatever. Um, and console is going to obviously be taking on some of these players in that space. So whether it's it's Microsoft Teams or you know Discord, Slack, or what there's telegram uh, just name name your name your bit messaging platform um i guess what i what i what i am interested in learning about is where do you view those companies in terms of their attitudes towards web3 because i know discord for example has flirted with some of the um, web3 integrations in the past and i know there's a ton of community backlash on their own side about you know i think they did, they want to do something very simple with nfts i think is what their idea at the post was i forget the exact specifics of this but all i remember is just seeing the vitriol in the twitter replies and i think it's coming eventually and so where do you envision this whole entire sector right now to be in terms of those outside of console and integrating web3 and then do you ever concern yourself with potentially having to compete against them to be the home of Web3 communities? Or do you think just naturally you're going to have that first mover advantage? Yeah, there's a lot of people now who are claiming to be, you know, Web3 Discord. And I don't know, I guess part of me just feels it's uh, such early days that it's just like, I can imagine that there's a lot of different use cases of what we're going after and that it's, mm -hmm. it could be just some healthy competition. I think especially if we're um, open source and potentially, you know, ways that we can composably work with each other. So I guess what I'm saying is I haven't seen anything yet that um, has been super interesting to me, but that's also knowing that at the same time, um, a lot of things seem to be in like in progress or kind of like also like us, like in this kind of like closed beta period. So, uh, so I think it's going to be interesting. Yeah. There's, there's a ton of people out there doing similar things. And I think, uh, I just, 
I'm waiting. Yeah, I'm waiting to get excited, and I'm waiting to right. uh, to see what happens. Yeah. Well, it's it's obviously tough to have a crystal ball and predict who is going to be the the quote unquote big winners. But it is interesting though seeing a lot of these larger firms or or companies, and they're looking into Web three and they're interested. And you clearly know people within the company are interested in seeing what they can adopt and take from the space or potentially integrate into their platforms. And the minute they do that, the users just like, no, 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 we don't want this. And I mean, really, it, it was spectacular uh, in a kind of a, a frightening way, <laughs> seeing how many people were just so anti anything um, related to Web3 or NFTs. And, you know, there's there's valid critiques of the space. And I, I, I totally understand that. But just the the, the tribalistic, like dogmatic um, pushback was was pretty was pretty uh, just it really blew my mind in terms of how much people really did not want this. And so I think that's going to actually lead to a lot of opportunity now um, for people to innovate and, and yeah. find ways to, to bring those people on board. You mean like when, when discord got pushed back from the community, is that what you're referring to? Yeah. I, I in one, I, yes. And there's also, I mean, there's also been a couple other, like I think it was Microsoft or someone who had some post about web three or something, something to do with, with, um, like Ethereum or some smart contract layer and people in the replies on Twitter is like, no, <laughs> like, clearly, clearly this is not it. Um, and it's like, okay, thanks. Thanks for your input. But I mean, you get enough people behind that and that affects the general operations of the company in, in a public yeah. opinion. Yeah. I think, I think, you know, the platforms will, it makes sense in any, I think in any kind of tech shift, like the incumbents are going to push back until it's big enough for them to worry about. And once it's big enough for them to worry about, you know, if, if we've done our work, I think, you know, then, then we will have, you know, potentially created something even better from, from scratch that's native, you know, I think that's what we're doing. So it makes a lot of sense. They push back, you know, at the same time, you know, I guess through their eyes, I can see, um, I can see it. Like in some ways, you know, MetaMask is still evolving and mm -hmm. like, you know, some of these things are still new, but I I'm really excited and, and bullish about um, the future of web wallets, whether it's MetaMask or, or other ones, as well as like ENS and, um, you know, decentralized identity and um, just a variety of different, um, yeah, a variety of different projects. You know, um, we're, we're also very, uh, excited about the Stacks project, which builds on Bitcoin. So I think mm -hmm. that's also another like really blue ocean of development happening. So I don't know. There's a lot, there's just a lot of really cool stuff, and I think over the next two three years, we're going to see the ecosystem evolve, and then hopefully console and and other people can build tools that you know really wow Slack mm -hmm. and Teams and Discord and all the incumbents. I think in a few years. Yeah, this segues nicely into one of my wrapping up questions here, and that is looking ahead at the future and what you're hoping to see. Um, and so I want to ask you, you know, what is it that you hope the future of decentralized communication and organization looks like? And it's tough to have that end game goal, but is there any sort of philosophical foundations or just beliefs that you hope to see integrated going forward? Identity and security are way more important than we give credit for these mm -hmm. days. I think most people think, well, you know, I haven't been hacked or I haven't had this problem and I don't have to worry about it or something like that. Um, but actually it's happening all the time and it does affect us. Um, and, and the infrastructure of it's really sensitive and weak right now where it can be abused. And so just like a kind of quick example of that, um, you know, there's a lot of bots online if you look on Twitter. And historically, uh, just to give you one example, like the ability to just spin up bots and do whether it's phishing attacks uh, or whether it's some kind of what I would say is propaganda, essentially. And, you know, I could share quite a few examples of this, but people basically spin up swarms like swarms of bees of these of these bots in order to push public opinion, certain types of mm -hmm. political propaganda, certain types of like, whether it's anti-COVID, you know, like things that I think are really harmful for the world. And um, a lot of this just kind of stems from the fact that it's just too easy to come online and make identities, right? Um, so I think that this evolution of us owning our identity, the way that we own right now Bitcoin, and I think a lot of people have this aha moment, they're like, oh, you know, not your keys, not your coin. 
I think the next few years is going to be uh, not your keys, not your identity. Mm. And it's going to just like raise all the boats, I think, uh, across the internet for what, how we value trust, how we value connection, uh, reputation, all these kind of things. And I think this becomes the primitive, like the, the like building block upon which we can, um, you know, I think build the next generation of apps, build essentially a new internet that's going to be really powerful um, for hopefully making the world a bit of a better place. You know what I mean? That's Absolutely. like, that's, yeah. that's the hope we all have, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I'd say that's that's like my kind of underpinning or hope, I think for, for all the work that we're doing is to just be part of that, to kind of push that narrative forward and make some apps that can, um, yeah, make make things run a little smoother in the world. Yeah, great answer. And as we see the whole entire privacy debate continue because everything's becoming digitized now. I mean, last week you saw at Jackson Hole, they were speaking about central bank digital currencies and it was like, uh, I forgot the, who the speaker was exactly, but they basically said, uh, he said how if the United States builds a CBDC, you know, why do we do that versus a country like China that has a specific, you know, privacy, uh, maybe lack of privacy uh, motive behind that they want to tr like track transaction results and have a better idea of what of what things are going on and you know i i eventually see things like ids becoming digitized obviously money um but there, i still don't think that necessarily means you have to sacrifice things like privacy and you know if i go to a bar and i need to scan in my id and i don't have a physical id but i have a, a, some sort of digital id you know i could easily see there being ways of having zero knowledge proofs to then identify like yeah this is me without actually having to then give away my whole entire identity to some person who's just trying to let me into this bar. And so I, I see a lot of very exciting, not only digital methods of implementing these things, but also uh, real world ways of implementing these things. And, you know, as you mentioned, not, not your keys, not your identity. Um, I, I don't think a lot of like, I know it's funny because I've grown up, my parents were always like, you know, don't talk to strangers on the internet, whatever. But now it's like, I feel as if I'm the one trying <laughs> to protect my own data these days, but it's almost impossible to do it. And you have to do those trade-offs. We have the large, big tech social media companies who are taking your data. It's going to be a, a big, you know, I hope innovation is ultimately what what figures out the ways and solutions to this, to, to create this sort of happy medium where people are able to retain the important information that they want to hold dearest to them. Um, but yeah, overall, I, I do I do agree with your vision there, and, and I do hope to to see it happen as um, as we, we still figure out this whole entire Web three and crypto world, uh, digital digital identity, metaverse, whatever people want to call it. Um, moving on here, uh, I want to ask you just about the current timeline of things for console. So, if you mind just giving the one to two minute roadmap for the short to medium term, what are the important dates coming up? When are you hoping to launch the web app? When are you hoping to launch maybe on the on uh, mobile? Um, and just moving from there. Yeah, thanks for asking. Um, so the web app is live now for two communities. Um, over the next few weeks, we will announce, we'll, we'll tell more about who those communities are because basically you, you could join one of those communities to get a sneak peek. Um, so I would say if you want updates on console, probably the best places are Twitter. Um, you could just go to at console DAO, C-O-N-S-O-L-E-D-A-O, -E um, or our website console.xyz. Um, so yeah, we are, the web, the web app is live. Um, but if you want to, if you have a community and you'd like to come to console, um, it's going to be a little bit later this year, probably like mid end October that we'll start to onboard, um, the next kind of batch of, we're calling them cohorts. Um, mm -hmm. so if you would like to be considered, um, feel free to either tweet at us or, you can also apply. We have an application online. Um, it's at our site, console.xyz. Just kind of look on the corner for communities and you'll you'll find it. Um, so yeah, that's one way to do it. Um, later this year, we'll have our iPhone app and our Android app come out. Um, I think that's going to be really exciting. Just the idea of being able to, from your phone, chat with .eth, speaks to .eth, uh, you know, or .btc, or eventually .soul. Like, I think the ability to just have decentralized identities. Um, I think that I think it's personally a game changer for, for, for me, someone who personally really dislikes Telegram, um, just for the mm. secure. The in, it's no one is using the end-to-end -end encryption security. Uh, <laughs> It has my phone number on there, which doxes me every time I talk yep. with somebody. Like, there's just so many problems with it. I get a lot of spam on it. So I think, you know, the iPhone app is going to be a really nice um, ad where you can have, uh, yeah, essentially it's like your own little whitelisted community of, uh, of, of crypto 
people that you could chat with. And I think that's mm-hmm. going to be, I think it's going to be really exciting. So a lot of really cool um, stuff coming out. And if anyone's interested, we'd love to chat, tell you more. So please be in touch. Absolutely. Once again, to everyone listening or watching, all of this will be in the show notes. So definitely check it out if you're interested. I have one more question for you today. I know you go back and forth. Uh, yeah, yeah. One last question. And this is not a crypto related question. We always like to end on a fun fact. Um, and I, I've thrown out some random ones. More of, a, more of a straightforward one this week. But uh, my fun fact question for you is what is your beverage of choice on a Friday night? And this can be alcoholic or non-alcoholic. <laughs> Well, if I'm writing, it's probably coffee. I'm probably still drinking <laughs> coffee. Um, if I'm if I'm traveling and uh, I'm in Berlin, which is where I happen to be uh, at the moment, I would say it's probably uh, Club Mate. <laughs> Very nice, sir. Chris, or Castig, sorry. Thank you again so much for coming on. Really an interesting project. Just it's it's fascinating to see how people are figuring out solutions to a lot of the issues we're facing um, as Web3 communities are trying to figure out the best way to organize, best way to bring people on. How do you efficiently do all this? And I'm, I'm glad to see people putting brain power behind this and really finding the solutions they hope to see take a mass adoption. So I really appreciate your time once again. Yeah, I know. Thank, thanks for being here. Thanks for asking such thoughtful questions and for having such a great forum to discuss these topics. I really appreciate that, Rick. Thank you.